Okay, yes, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be uh, giving this keynote at Tenor. It's a really interesting uh, conference. I've been at Tenor two or three times and I've always been very inspired by um, the proceedings and of course the music, the performances. So um, I've found that um, this is an open-minded conference uh, really questioning the core of, of music technologies, but very much, of course, from the representation of music, so notation and so on. And I'm very interested in kind of trying to approach it today, my keynote, from um, the perspective of representation. When Rama asked me to do this keynote uh, a year and a half ago, probably, which it, of course it didn't happen because of COVID a year ago. He uh, suggested that I would um, mention my book or a work from the book. And this is my book. It's called Sonic Writing um, Technologies of Material, Symbolic and Signal Inscriptions. And um, I would like to use that as some kind of a foundation for this talk here. Uh, the talk is called The Symbol and the Signal. And this is really where I think it's at today in our work with music technologies. Because with digital technologies, we're constantly working at this intersection between the symbolic and the signal. It's the audio and then it's the computational manipulation of the audio. And on the, on the contrary as well, vice versa, it's the creation of that audio through software that is largely symbolic. Um, so let me see if I can. So I'm interested in asking what is happening in 21st century music? We have this transformation in roles. I'm not telling you anything new. You all know this transformation in roles where the roles of composers, interpreters, instruments, works of, of music and audience, they're all fusing and kind of interacting with each other. Um, the technology is drastically changing our interfaces, the time-space compression, we're working across time and space, like now. Um, machine learning and deep learning has become an incredibly powerful force in music technologies. And we see some amazing uh, developments in creative AI at the moment. So the, this is, of course, transforming tradition as well. How do we translate these tra um, established practices to new t technologies? Do we want that? What do we want to take with us to the digital new realm? And what do we leave behind? And are we really aware of it? Are we conscious of the things that we take with us and why? Are we conscious of the things that disappear, traditions that get left behind when we move into the digital with new software, new AI? And, and, and how does this affect education and tradition um, of education, pedag pedagogy? What do we teach? How do we practice our instruments? What is the knowledge transfer? between a teacher and a student? And how do we then enjoy music? What does it mean when, when these concepts are all changing? How do we understand what is really going on? How do we even feel about music that we know that is generated by artificial intelligence? There are these things on Spotify already. Um, many people don't know of it. Is it even an ethical question whether we should let people know that um, the music they're listening to is generated by an artificial intelligence? So these are all very interesting questions, I think. And I think the 21st century is really a century of AI. Um, it is a century of um, digital musical instruments. So if the 
19th century was acoustic instruments and the standardization of acoustic instruments, the refinement of these instruments, the kind of mass production of, of pianos and violins and clarinets and so on, saxophones, inventions. Then maybe the 20th century was a century of electric instruments, electronic instruments, synthesizers and so on. Of course, we had digital musical instruments at the end of the 20th century, but those, was, those were largely simulations of acoustic and electronic instruments. And then with the 20, in the, now in the 21st century, we're kind of opening up into a new century of art, uh, yeah, computational technologies. It's not really the digital that is important, but it's the computational. And then with technologies that can learn how is this affecting um, our, our understanding of, of technology. I think, um, let me see. So in my book, I, it's, it's divided into four parts. The fourth part is on the digital writing, but the first three parts are on the material, symbolic and signal inscriptions of music. How we write music into formats and how we record formats, how, we, how the formats that we use kind of um, maintain the music, inscribe the music, and frame the music uh, in a theoretical context. So Sonic Writing, the book, explores the unique relationship we have with our musical instruments, our technologies for making sound. And there are very few things that humans have that we have such intimate and caring relationship with as musical instruments. So these technologies have evolved over millennia and through instruments, system designs, theory, notation, phonography and computational creativity, music has always been at the cusp of our technological development and understanding. So musical instruments are quite unique. They represent the high technology of each cultural period and at the same time they're an instrument to look into our inner self and to speculate about new cultural forms. So Sonic Writing, the book, tries to understand the role of these new technologies of music making and, um, and how this is contextualized in wider um, cultural practices. So how do these techniques that we have developed over millennia translate into digital um, technologies? To understand this, I, I operate from the perspective of organology, the science of musical instruments, which involves the analysis, the practice, history, evolution, taxonomies and classification of instruments, I'm looking into the material context of the instruments, but also the cultural context and the music theoretical context, looking at how the instruments uh, change the way we think and um, the way we play and operate with music. So critical analytics of digital musical instruments can be, um, it can be useful to have an organizational principle like some kind of classification. Uh, the classification we see here is the one of um, Hornbostel and Sachs with idiophones, aerophones, chordophones, membranophones, and later electrophones. And this is a way to kind of have some control over the chaos of, of musical instruments. The problem is that the digital instruments, they, they don't fit into these uh, areas, especially because our instruments nowadays, they merge the acoustic and the electronic and the digital into, into an assemblage. And that is assemblage can be using then technologies from all over, all kinds of protocols, all kinds of um, material and technological items, elements that are brought together into that unique 
a musical instrument. So it's very difficult to apply some organizational, um, organological principles to digital musical technologies. And what I'm interested in looking at here is, is a little bit the kind of differences between these three types of instruments in order to understand how we operate with the signal and the symbols of these instruments. So you can see that uh, I've got three. I've got an acoustic, electronic and digital instrument here uh, in these tuxedo dressed um, performers. And I'd like to propose that um, we use um, Pierce's um, um, semiotics on this, where we see that the, class, uh, the cello is an icon, the theremin is an index, and the hands of Michel Weiswitz are the symbol. Because the cello is at the same time its sign and the interface and the sound source. There is a direct and necessary relationship between the interface and the sound. And that's one based on the acoustics or physical laws of sound. The interface and the instrument is the same thing. So composing for these things, writing notation for these things, you, are, you know what you're writing for, you know what the performer can do, and you're able to map your notation to things on the instrument itself. The electronic instrument, the indexical instrument, um, here there is a link between the sign and the signified, between the filter knob and the filter behavior, or the hand movement and the resulting sound. And this is a contiguous link. It is necessary, there is a direct uh, connection between movement and the gesture and uh, sound. Yet, there are so many settings, so many pre presets, so many ways of changing the sounds of these instruments that it becomes rather difficult to compose for them. What does it mean to compose for a theremin? Um, possibly, uh, easy with the theremin, but what if it was a bookless synth, for example, or a modular synth? How do you even uh, get, how do you even notate for such systems? Other than actually just plugging it yourself, and your notation would be some kind of a cable diagram, and the location of the knobs. Even then, you're in a problem, you have a problem of um, kind of recalling the same preset as you once had. Then we have digital instruments and they are symbolic. The mapping between the interface and um, the sound is arbitrary. Any gesture can map to any sound. And this can be computational. So this is mapping that can evolve or can be dynamic. Um, so we have a completely different um, mapping than from the icon. And here again we have a, quite a difficult situation of notating for this digital instrument. What are you notating for? Some, some particular preset of the instrument? Or is even that preset the composition itself? Are we then talking about the notation and the instrument becoming the one and the same thing? And that's, that's where I think um, the digital and uh, 21st musical in century musical instruments are becoming quite interesting in the context of this conference is to understand how the new technologies are changing our notational practices, changing the definition of the composer and the performer and of the musical instrument as perhaps a musical piece as well. But I'd like to look back a little bit. I'd like to look back at instruments in the, as, as kind of epistemic tools. What is this? Uh, what is it what we see here? It's a 40,000 year old flute 
and you see a material object, a technology of music making, music technology, and you can see that the holes are spaced out deliberately, probably, but at least what they get, the, the people who use this flute, they have a musical system, they have a scale. This is the music theory of that group. And this flute would have been um, in this cave for generations of, of people growing up, growing up, growing up, being born and, and die in that cave. But the flute is the kind of material constant that keeps the music theory alive. And this is what um, Bernard Stiegler talks about grammatization. It's an externalization of a, a theory. It is a technological constant that keeps our theory um, material. So we have here a symbolic thing. We, we have something outside ourselves that is not the continuous um, kind of analog um, pitch of our voice, but rather something that is dis discrete and digital in the flute. We can then see with uh, our earliest um, kind of myths and writing in, in Greek antiquity, how uh, the story of Apollo and Marsyas fighting, having a musical context, contest, how symbolic this is with the harp being r the rational kind of tuning, the Pythagorean kind of um, uh, rational numbers, um, and the harp could be perfectly tuned. And that's the instrument of Apollo, the god of music. And Marsaya came and challenged him. Marsaya played the flute. The flute is something, the aulos is something that you stick into your mouth and you lose the power of speech by having this thing in your mouth. You play the instrument and the instrument is breath, psyche. Spirit, you know, it's it's connected to the to the kind of earthy of the of the human existence, the emotional as opposed to the logical, and you see this kind of evolve in religion in medieval times. This idea that instruments are something dirty, but the word, the logos, is something that is uh, of higher importance. This is Saint Cecile looking at some angels singing some uh, hymns from above but all the instruments are lying in the ground dirty broken um, in the mud i'm pointing you to a bit of a history of musical uh, how how we perceive musical instruments and uh, the role of musical instruments in our culture they've always been important and here in the laboratory of academy de sciences in paris you can see from the 17th century you can see instruments of science weights scales binoculars you know uh, telescopes um, camera obscura all kinds of things globes these are instruments of science but here in the right corner bottom right corner you can also see musical instruments and that's not because um, of these scientists entertaining themselves uh, in their breaks playing some music, the musical instruments are scientific instruments. By playing them, you would learn about um, waves, sound, uh, psychoacoustics, tuning, numbers, and so on, physics, basically. So music and musical instruments were an important part of um, laboratory work. And they still are. Here we have Laetitia Sonami playing an instrument um, where she is using machine learning mapping uh, to map the gestures on that interface she's got to sound. And um, I could point to all kinds of AI labs. For example, Google has the Magenta Lab or OpenAI has the Jukebox project. These are all musical projects 
run by the best um, AI labs that exist and they find that music and its instruments are a worthy platform for exploring um, new ideas. So we have this history of musical instruments in our culture and we have a history of writing for them, understanding them, setting them in the context of, of our culture. And I'd like to talk a little bit about symbolic inscriptions. That's the second part of my book. But that's really systems of notation or systems of um, generative music, music theory, anything that encapsulates music in the form of symbols that then can be uh, rendered in a performance. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the converted here. You all know this very well, the history of, of musical notation, uh, the, the importance of Guido de Arezzo in, in this um, context, his experiments with gestural notations of the hand, of algorithmic not, uh, systems, mapping consonants to, or vowels to um, notes. And of course, the staff, staff notation. Um, these are symbols. And the interesting things with these symbols are, of course, that they stand for um, notes or gestures on, on the instrument. They, of course, are abstractions. They don't connote the tacit knowledge of musical performance. We don't know how this music was played. You cannot read the music from the symbols. This is an abstract kind of map of, of a practice that we don't know how it was. And with the Gutenberg press, with the type um, movable type technology, the potential for, for making musical notation a file format, a musical format that could be distributed and disseminated and um, shared across countries, across continents even, uh, was quite powerful and the music press became quite um, an important industry. This is a technology that of course made um, the idea of the composer possible because you suddenly you have technology to share this music as a commercial um, entity rather than aristocratic kind of court, court composers. And this notation evolved and became more and more sophisticated. I think here at, uh, on this slide we have a um, Fernie Howe score, um, very complex. But you can see how, how um, the language has evolved, the symbol standing for something very nuanced in, in the performance itself. And um, then we have new media and new notations for new media. Uh, with electronic instruments, composers started to think, uh, I can't compose for this. Why should I even compose for this if computers are able to render uh, music more perfectly than humans? Perhaps I should just create something abstract for the humans because that's what they're good at. They're good at interpreting uh, and creating as opposed to the machine. But all these symbols, they stand for uh, events. They stand for musical events and typically for note events like dynamics, pitch, uh, and so on. And um, Berando here, I think we've um, met him in the tenor conferences before. He says, um, it wasn't until the 20th century that timbre would be definitely established as a structural parameter. More precisely, it was in the second half of the century 
that thanks to the information technology, electronic music and the work of spectral composers, we came to understand that the concept of timbre could no longer be conceptually and materially separated from those of pitch, dynamics and temporal flux. So timbre has become a compositional parameter, but how do you notate for it? What does it even mean to notate for timbre? And timbre changes in, in musical instruments tend to be continuous and not one-off events like the blobs on our staff notation. So of course, uh, composers have come up with all kinds of systems to, to represent timbre. But what timbre really is, is a signal. You need that almost like a signal um, notation rather than a symbol not notation. It is a signal. It is change over time, continuous. It's not a discrete event. And this is where I'm kind of contextualizing the third uh, part of my book, Signal Inscriptions, where for the first time in the 20th century, of course, it, the technology was invented in the late 19th, but um, for the first time in the 20th century, we, we were able to write music itself, the signal, not just the symbols standing for the music, but, but the music itself. And the signal is um, analogous and continuous. There are no symbols in, in, the, in the vinyl. It's just conti uh, continuous symbol. So the signal is like descriptive notation. It is capturing um, the, the sound as opposed to the descriptive, prescriptive notation of the symbol. And recorded music comes in here. Um, machine listening. With machine listening, we suddenly start to be able to listen to the signal of sound and derive symbolic knowledge from it automatically. So that's almost like machine writing or trans transcription and so on. There are earlier transcription systems, but with uh, fast Fourier transform and, and the kind of opportunity to have windows um, and FFT analysis, we're able to do, to perform operations on the sound signal that hitherto were impossible. We could uh, classify, we could put things into categories, into databases, and so on. And I put here the core position uh, projects of Nick Collins and Bob Sturm, um, where they are listening to um, music in variously through um, MIDI data or uh, timbre with machine listening uh, or the sound signal and they are generating new music from large data. So um, in digital writing the fourth part of the book I'm here interested in how does this, how do these three practices of creating instruments, inscribing music into instruments, inscribing music into uh, notational systems, and inscribing music into linear analog formats, uh, whether it's um, digital, I mean, the digital becomes analog, of course, when it's a, and it is a signal. Uh, how do we take this with us into the digital? How do we take um, the signal, the symbolic, and the material with us. What is it that we leave behind? What is uh, given to us by the digital? What, what is it that when we create a new instrument, a new, uh, and we apply new sensor technologies from wherever, uh, you know, the internet, the GPS, uh, the kind of vision systems, that we use um, 3D cameras and so on. What do these technologies bring with them? What opportunities, what affordances do they have? 
But what we see in the digital is that we start to play with the symbolic and the signal in a very interesting way. We can start to look at music, we can analyze the, the musical symbols like in a MIDI file or in a score and we can see the patterns and we can have computers reading those patterns. We can use machine learning to, to store big data, read million files and store them in databases and we can then spit out new music from that. And I say here look, looking at music because we're not really listening when we're um, operating with uh, MIDI data. But then here in this, on this slide I talk about listening to music uh, where we're using machine listening and spectral analysis where we um, classify the music in various ways and we store the, the windows or we store the music um, in the database. And this allows for various applications such as read synthesis, recreation of, of music and imitating styles of production, for example, mastering and post-production. A good example is the OpenAI Jukebox, which I think has done an amazing work with um, imitating um, uh, known musicians. Just from sample level kind of analysis of um, and FFT window analysis of, um, of the signal. So how, how do we operate with the signal and the symbol? We have machine learning and the machine learning can derive, it can do classifications, it can put things into categories for us and these become sig sig symbols that we can operate with in our computational systems. We can create interfaces for these symbols, we can manipulate them and turn them back into signal, into sound. So how do these things um, kind of interweave in our new technologies? I'm also interested in how big com uh, commercial companies are using uh, big data as opposed to small data. I mean, we can all work with machine learning on our own computers, on our own music, but that's small data. Even if you have a thousand compositions in your, on your hard, hard drive, that's, that's small data. The big data of these um, commercial companies are, are like... Uh, thousands of gigabytes and thousands of, uh, you know, millions of songs and so on. And um, what they are doing is to set up a subscription model for music production tools and for listening, uh, like Netflix and Spotify, Adobe and so on. And these companies will be able to parse, use the data, the styles, the methods, the habits. They can see patterns emerging in different parts of the world. Um, and um, they're able to cl cluster and classify and see things, um, user, user changes and habits in the software. So this is a new way of thinking about creativity because here the company can then feed back and say, you might want to do this. Here is something interesting that a lot of people are doing. Why don't you do that? And Indeed, we're here working with symbolic data. You're getting the software is tracking user activity, turning them into um, perceivable parameters, symbols that can be, then be shared or, or, or sent back into the user interfaces of the software. So we're here talking about the symbolic, we're talking about notation, we're talking about um, systems of making music, uh, just as um, the, the notational systems of Guido de Arezzo. 
So I'm interested in, in then thinking about these instruments and, and the symbolic and the signal nature of the, them. I mean, a slider can be seen as, as symbolic, you know, it's, it's, it's a gain control for a pickup. And you see that in this uh, cello-like Haldorophone instrument here on the left. Um, the Novation controller at the top here is, is largely symbolic as well. But then when you turn the knob, it, it, it sends out MIDI data in a row, but that data is turned into a signal. So the, it's an interesting kind of, you're constantly, there is no separation between the analog and the digital, really. It's all, it's all both. There's digital in the analog and analog in the digital. So what I find that these instruments and these new technologies are doing, I find that they are questioning or, or encouraging us to question the, the work concept because the instruments are becoming such a strong symbolic um, systems on their own and I'd like to contextualize that a little bit with Lydia Gurr who I think most of you know um, I think she, her book musical of musical works was a questioned very much the the idea of the the work the romantic kind of um, work of the romantic uh, composer genius um, and sh she argues that Bach didn't compose musical work. Uh, it's a romantic idea. And she is then looking into Baroque music and maybe electronic music. And she says that um, the book obviously is, is what, 20, 30 years old. Um, that in electronic music, you start to see practices uh, where you start to lose the work. And I'm interested in, in the context of, of tenor. What is the work? Are we losing the work? And you might wonder if, if the digital, the new artificial intelligence systems that we're seeing, you might wonder if it's threatening the existence of um, practices like those that you might imagine with tenor. But as I said in the beginning of my talk, I do find that the Tenor Conference is, is forward-reaching. Uh, it's looking into the future. It is um, a conference of people that are excited about the potential of, of contemporary and future technologies. So I don't think there is any threat here. I think it's more of an opportunity and a, an, an interesting, exciting um, area to work in because what I then argue in the book is that um, we are moving from the maybe romantic um, like Gur explains the romantic idea of composing a work to an understanding of inventing a system So composition, you might notice if you're into etymology and, and kind of ancient languages, compos composing is a, is a Latin word that means putting things together. And so is system, is a Greek word, which means to put things together, or they stand together. And you might also notice that work is also, also an invention. Bach created the inventions. You know Bach's inventions. They are renderings of, of, of a core idea. But what I'm saying is that we are kind of moving from one metaphysical system t or, or ontological system of music ontology. We're moving from composing a work to inventing a system. And that system is then one where you have the instrument, the material inscriptions, you have the symbolic inscriptions and the signal inscriptions all interweaved into one system. 
where the signal and the symbol becomes part of it, which then also means that you as composers will be people who work w as instrument designers, as score, um, as not, n not uh, composing with scores, and often performing uh, the pieces yourself with your instruments. And I think that's a very normal practice to, to this group here. Um, so I, I'm at my last minute. I didn't want to speak more than um, three quarters of an hour, but I, my, my final slide is um, here with a statue of Plato. And in his um, dialogue on etymology called Cratylus, he describes how the origins of the term music derives from uh, the muses' search for truth. And he says, Plato, the name of the muses and of music would seem to be derived from their making of philosophical inquiries, musai. So music is search, music is what we do when we open up new um, dimensions trying to find things. And of course today we use technologies for those um, activities and the representation of music with those technologies that's really I think where we're in a very exciting uh, field at the moment and I think the Tenor Conference is a brilliant place to be to explore um, this area of, of music and music technology. So I'm, I'm just going to end here now and I hope that uh, we can have 15 minutes of conversation um, ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thor, for this uh, wonderful keynote presentation. Um, I'd like to open the Q&A se uh, session and I'm um, asking, so maybe we should all... Uh, uh, give you a round of applause here. Clap your hands <laughs> virtually. <laughs> That's beautiful. See all okay. those uh, Homer Simpson's hand here clapping. Hmm. All right. So, um, who would like to? Uh, who who has a, a question that you would like to pose? He or she. I could see Rolf Grossman um, raising a Please. hand. Right. I think we need to see hands. So you can go to the reaction uh, icon and just click on raise hands if you would like to ask a question. So S Sam, Sam Hayden <coughs> has a, his hand up. So. Sam, please go ahead. Hi, Thor. Nice to see you. Hello, um, Sam. Excellent talk. Fantastic. Very interesting. I mean, I had a very <clears throat> kind of broad question in relation to your kind of historic view, um, where technology, <clears throat> if I'm right, seems to be very much, uh, in your view, um, technological innovation implies aesthetic innovation. Um, when we look at, but you yourself were talking about the use of big data and, you know, Google and Spotify and all this. And I think we can agree that there's quite a lot of uh, nefarious use of big data. So in, in many ways, technology I would say is not necessarily aligned to uh, aesthetic innovation in that context anyway. So I, I wonder if, uh, I mean, this is a very sort of idealistic view, it seems, of the relationship between technology and aesthetics. I, I think, I, I just wondered how you, you, what is your view on that? Yeah, brilliant. This is a very good question. And of course, I share your uh, skepticism and, and um, 
against the, the big kind of data moguls like Amazon, Google and Facebook and so on. Um, even, even Spotify and native instruments, if they go into this uh, data mining kind of um, big data th um, practice, it is complicated. Um, but of course, these things are, I, I mean, at the moment, machine learning is recreating, really. It's not very original. It's not bringing something new forward. These technological companies are developing uh, technologies at the moment. They're developing machine learning technologies and machine listening technologies and so on, which we can use. What I'm interested in is then how we can take and use these technologies because, op you know, a lot of the machine learning will become open source. We will be able to use small data and it will be more ethically uh, sound to use small data rather than big data, for example, okay. just from an so environmental sort of perspective. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of proposing a slightly countercultural view of AI in that sense. I think we need to take take control and yeah take it into our own hands and yes uh, use it uh, and I don't think it will end up with the big uh, moguls forever although they might be currently doing some some um, big data things I, d I think we will be able to use these technologies in and, and maybe the analogous uh, situation would be, you know, the, the radio studios in um, the 40s and 50s. There were some privileged people that had access to tape machines, you know, Pierre Schaeffer and so on. Um, and the rest didn't have access to these. But nowadays this is trivial technology and we can all use it. So I think we're going to see the same with um, data, uh, with machine learning. The question is, of course, and that's the sinister. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not obvi oblivious to the to the problems of big data and and personal data harnessing and and the use of that, of course. Mm -hmm. But I believe that we can do a lot of things with small data. Okay, thank you. Mm. Um, I think this is probably a, a bigger discussion, but it is. I'll, yes, yes. I'll leave it for other nice people question. Now. Thanks. Yeah. See you soon. Okay, so we have another hand and someone else who um, was uh, writing his question in the, ch in the chat window. So, uh, so Rolf has uh, Rolf Grossman has uh, had its hand up first, and then I'm going to read the question by Konstantinos Vasilakos. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. Um, and it, it make it make me thinking uh, about two consequences, and these are my questions. Um, what consequence would be for the role and the relationship between composer and the um, Ausführende, and it's in German the performer, perhaps. Um, and um, so, if you say um, I like the pathetic of Beethoven, that's my work. Um, so, but you don't not uh, um, every time uh, mention who is playing the pathetic. You like this work, and so. But nobody likes systems, or do you think something? So, will it change the star status from the uh, system composers to the uh, performance. Uh, that's the first question. And the second is, uh, second um, consequence is that we perhaps would need another um, music edu education for the instruments because we have a long tradition of very rigid uh, instrumentation, uh, instrumental pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps we can change it to a more human um work around with inside music education mm, so this yeah. both questions yeah great questions really good um regarding the composer this is such a complex question because we have so many people making music today compared with in the past and um you have, I, I have heard composer friends say, 
you're lucky if you get your piece performed once and it's 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 a miracle if your piece is played twice um are you imagining that uh, my friend composer who said this will be in 200 years time that his pieces are going to be played i don't think so <laughs> uh, so so these these are pieces that are played once or twice and hopefully well documented and so on um What a lot of new composers are doing then is to say, well, I'm not going to work in this context. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to create my own technologies. I'm going to create my own ensembles. It's a bit like what uh, Steve Rack and you know, Philip Glass were doing with their ensembles in the 70s. Nobody wanted to play their music. They just created their own um, groups to play their pieces. Um, so that's one thing I think, and but I'd like to contradict myself as well because I agree with your thing that that um, a score is a gift to the world. It's almost like a computer game that you can give to people and say, "Here, um, would you like to play this?" And it is wonderful to play a musical score. It is great to be an instrumentalist and study a piece and get to know that piece and reach depth with that piece. So I think one practice, one technology is not necessarily going to erase everything else and burn everything that already exists. We're still going to have these practices because they're great. Um, but that then leads to your second question, which is about the new digital instruments. I can imagine composers writing for the piano for the next hundreds of years, you know. But I'm not sure if they're going to be writing for um, the digital instruments that we have at the moment. For the reason that it's very hard to know what they're writing for and the interface might change. The sound engine might change. What are you going to write? What, what is it really that you do? Why don't you just make your own instrument and um, perform it yourself or, or have a, you know, a group performing it? So what does it mean to be a composer in that technological situation? It means that you become an, an engineer, a, a technological technolo technologist. And that means that our conservatories, our universities need to respond to that. And you see in certain countries, in certain institutions, you can see that music technology is taking this on. But it has a strange and funny uh, kind of dialectic or, or uh, where one stream is new technologies, new ways of thinking music, and the other stream is the kind of uh, vocational kind of studio practice um, recording uh, technology education so yeah I think I think both exist and and um, I, I totally agree with the premises of your question I think they were interesting but I I, I just think that we're gonna say see um, a pluralization of practices uh, flowering of new ways of doing things as music has always done so so i'm optimistic that we're going to see um interesting emerging musical practices coming coming out of this thank you thanks i have to intervene unfortunately uh we have uh three more minutes left and i want to also introduce the next event uh um, there's one more question, and I wonder whether uh, this question should maybe be answered in a different session. We have the meet and greet uh, between uh, 8 and 10 tonight. So this will be an opportunity for, for Konstantinos to ask his questions directly, provided that, Thor, you also uh, join the meet and greet tonight. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, um, I think, yes, maybe I should, we should uh, come to a, an end now. I just uh, uh, would like to mention that the next event 
is the opening concert. Is it's uh, this piece called Prana by Sandy Bhagwati. We have a an ensemble consisting of four players, a quartet with a very uh, peculiar name. It's so the the name is so wrong. It's right. So that's um, that's an interesting concept, which also has some philosophical implications, which we can also probably talk about after the the concert at the meet and greet. I also have some questions for Thor, which I hope I will be able to ask at some point. It concerns the the aspects of semiotics or semi semiology that you were addressing. Very exciting, very interesting. I've been also wondering about these things for a long, long time. I feel like uh, you wrote the book that I should have been writ uh, writing. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, thanks so much.